Welcome to the Sunday service from St. Nicholas Church in Adair, County Limerick, with the churches of Croom, Kilpeacon and Kilmallock. So often in life, things do not turn out as we expect. Despite our fondest wishes and our greatest efforts, the reactions of others and changing circumstances can mean that our plans turn into gossamer on the wind. In the very early days of Christianity, Christians were mostly Jews who might worship, study and eat together in each other's homes, but they would also worship at the synagogue. They followed Jesus and remained part of the Jewish community. By the time Matthew was writing, some years after the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the picture was changing. The Pharisees had emerged as the only surviving party in Judaism sanctioned by the Romans. And so the definition of what constituted the Ecclesia was forced to change through oppression and contention rather than original design or intention. We are as Christians, at least to some extent, an accident of history. So we start our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You are the never-ceasing open gift of love. We turn in upon ourselves. Lord, have mercy. You live beyond all centres of power. We seek to enclose your grace. Christ, have mercy. You rejoice in a multitude of names. We try to pin you down. Lord, have mercy. May the power of heaven protect us this day and circle us with the blessing of peace. May Christ, our Lord and loving friend, protect us this day and circle us with affection and love. May the Spirit of Truth, who dwells in our hearts, protect us this day and circle and fill us with joy. Amen. And so we pray. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, Remind us of your goodness, increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, from chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Here ends the reading. Now hear the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So often in life things do not turn out as we expect. Despite our fondest wishes and our greatest efforts, the reactions of others and changing circumstances mean that our plans can turn to gossamer on the wind. According to legend, the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was once asked what he feared most in the near future, and he answered, Events, dear boy, events. We can lay the greatest of foundations, make the most assiduous of preparations, but in time it is others who will shape and direct our greatest aspirations. It is they who will mould our plans into a new reality, sometimes one that we had neither foreseen nor desired. In this Sunday's passage from Matthew, as so often before, Jesus has withdrawn into a predominantly Gentile region, the district of Caesarea Philippi, and perhaps for much the same reason. Whenever he is in Jewish territory, in addition to those who wish to hear his message, he is always surrounded by Pharisees and Sadducees hoping to catch him out, twist his words to trap him on trumped-up charges. He is playing a game of cat and mouse with the authorities, dashing in for intense periods of teaching and pastoral ministry and then withdrawing into neutral territory. Indeed, underlying much of Matthew's narrative is the contrast between the power of Jesus' message and the fact that support in the Jewish community is so hard won and the temple authorities and the Pharisees so constantly hostile. In great measure, because they represent those with power, with vain certainty, with minds and hearts closed to new ideas and new insights. Of course, such people still exist today. But now, beyond the reach of Herod's spies, Jesus is free to talk plainly. So he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Clearly by this stage in his ministry, he is being widely discussed within the Jewish population. The first view is held by Herod himself. He sees Jesus as another John the Baptist, rabble-rousing, inspiring and challenging, but ultimately threatening and expendable. Others see him as Elijah, who it was foretold would return at the end of time. For remember, when you are invaded, subjugated and beaten down, it is easy to think that everything good is coming to an end. And unlike Mark and Luke, who also cover this story, Matthew adds Jeremiah, who also foretold rejection and suffering. 
Others see him like one of the prophets of the old days. Clearly, the views are varied and people are confused. Although in previous chapters there have been one or two comments about the son of David, and the witness of the Canaanite woman points to Jesus' growing reputation. Clearly people are wondering about the promises of old. So Jesus intensifies his questioning. If that is what others are saying, who do you think I am? Simply put, who do you say I am? And the question is so penetrating, not so much for what the answer might say about Jesus, but because of what it reveals about the person answering. Where Matthew's account varies enormously from Mark and Luke is in the way he treats Peter's answer. Peter has a profound revelation. Firstly, he confesses Jesus to be the Christos, the Christ, the Messiah the Greek and Hebrew terms for the charismatic man, the leader and king expected to be anointed by God to deliver the Jewish people from oppression, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and usher in the world to come. But Matthew reports that Peter goes even further and announces that he is the son of God a phrase that was previously used a number of times in the Bible to signify a just and pious man. But certainly by the time of Matthew, writing around AD 80, the early Christians believed that it connoted divinity. Until now, Jesus has been mainly referred to, especially by himself, as the Son of Man, a phrase used 107 times in the Hebrew Bible and 84 times in the New Testament, a description with arguably righteous or holy connotations, but mainly just an expression meaning me or this person, and also stressing human frailty and vulnerability. Now Peter changes everything. There is no going back from his pronouncement. Life will never be the same again for Jesus, but also for him. For certain insights, once accepted, demand that you live according to their meaning. It is more than a recognition, it is also a commitment. There are some things in life that you can skirt around. You Know that they are there, but you and perhaps others can pretend, can behave as if they don't exist. As long as you do not name the thing, as long as you do not imbue it with the power of a name, perhaps you can avoid it for a while, perhaps for a lifetime. But once you have recognized it, named it, there is no going back. It's rather like with relationships. You might know someone for years, but the moment you say, I love you, nothing will be the same again. There is no going back. Such statements can have enormous power. So understandably, this section from Matthew is one of the most hotly debated in the Bible. What is clear is that Peter's statement is the first and most obvious affirmation of Jesus' messiahship. Peter is now utterly committed. There is no graduation here. Peter is dedicating his very life to this statement and this conviction. In return, Jesus blesses him above all the other disciples. The language of the keys confers on Peter the authority to lead the new community, that Jesus seeks to create, and within that community to hold all teaching authority, to bind or to loose, which essentially means the power to forbid or to permit. 
Peter is to be entrusted with the authority to regulate this emerging community called by Matthew the Ecclesia, a Greek word from ancient Athens that originally described the very foundations of the city, the assembly in which all free men were members and who administered the social and political life of the whole population. Literally, it means to call out, and it came to be used about any council or convocation. Interestingly, Matthew uses this term for the new community rather than the conventional expression of synagogue. Matthew is flagging that this is something different, not necessarily separate, but certainly distinct. In the very early days of Christianity, Christians were mostly Jews who might worship, study and eat together in each other's homes, but they would also worship at the synagogue. They followed Jesus and remained part of the Jewish community. St Paul conducted his first long mission journeys to Jewish towns, preaching in synagogues around the mid-AD 40s and would have carried on but for meeting with little success. It was only later that he persuaded Peter that he should branch out to evangelizing Gentiles across the Roman Empire, and Peter continued to preach in Jewish communities. By the time Matthew was writing some years after the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the picture was changing. The Pharisees had emerged as the only surviving party in Judaism sanctioned by the Romans. There was simply no place anymore for diversity of opinion. And so the definition of what constituted the Ecclesia was forced to change through oppression and contention rather than original design or intention. We are, as Christians, at least to some extent, an accident of history. Knowing that, we might want to be rather more humble and less emphatic about who might now be called the sons and daughters of God, and accept that the definitions, demarcations and boundaries that the Church has imposed in the past may well not reflect the original intention of Jesus or his immediate followers. We should be grateful for what we now have, but also very circumspect about condoning any arbitrary or insular restrictions on the reach of God's love. We should instead be more concerned with the spotlight that Jesus shone on Peter and that he also shines on us. That question cascades down through the centuries and must be asked of each generation and of each person afresh. A lot of people say a lot of different things about Jesus, probably the man about whom more is written than any other in history. But in all that clamour, in all the debate, in all the speculation and claim and counterclaim, Jesus asks that question of us now. In the Gospel, Jesus stands before us now saying, Who do you say that I am? As with Peter, the answer tells us more about ourselves than it does about Jesus. And also, as with Peter, whatever the answer may be, do we truly live our lives in accordance with the answer? Because some answers change your life. Some answers mean you can never be the same again. In our hearts, who is he? And therefore, who are we? Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life. 
Therefore, let us remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours, and for the needs of the whole world. We hold before you the false distinctions that we create between people, based on race, culture, religion, the ways that we live and the people whom we love. Help us to see past the prejudices and divisions of past times and past ways, that we may instead pray for all people, whoever and wherever they may be. The road of life is already strewn with rocks and obstacles and misfortune. Let us not add to the pain of the world. Christ be within us, around and beside us. Bless our homes with holiness and hospitality, with cheerfulness and kindliness, with generosity and with goodness. We pray for all our loved ones, present and departed, the communities to which we belong and in which you have placed us to work and serve and contribute. Christ be within us, around and beside us. We pray for all who suffer through the cruelty of others, for all who have little confidence in themselves or in the world. We pray for those who find it hard to make and sustain relationships, we remember the lonely, those who feel rejected or betrayed. We pray for all who are in trouble, need, sickness or any other adversity. And especially we pray for people living under the constant fear and threat of violence and war. Christ be within us, around and beside us. We give thanks for all who have been strengthened by their faith, for all who have died in faith. We pray also for those who have struggled with a sense of belief, for whom faith was never easy or clear. May people be valued more for their hearts and their actions than their words, as we also seek to ensure that our claims and promises are borne out in our lives and loves. We hold before you all we have loved and lost, and all in need of your loving welcome and embrace. Amen. And now a few moments for our own concerns and prayers for those on our hearts.
Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. May the untamed welcome of the Father accept us for who we are. May the incarnation of the Word touch and hold us close. May the wandering of the Spirit help us to risk ourselves for love. And the blessing of God, the Holy Three, be among you and remain with you now and for ever. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.